right, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anjali, I'm one of the uh, incoming QI chief residents. And um, today I have the pleasure of introducing um, our two grand round speakers today. Um, so the first presentation will be by Dr. Albert Craig Lockhart, um, who is the chief of division of medical oncology. Um, his primary academic mission centers on early clinical drug development in oncology with a focus on upper gastrointestinal cancers. Dr. Lockhart earned his medical degree at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School and did his residency in internal medicine at Washington University in St. Louis. He completed fellowship training in hematology and oncology, as well as a master's degree in clinical research at Duke University. After completing his training at Duke, Dr. Lockhart was an assistant professor of medicine in the division of hematology oncology at Vanderbilt University. Before coming to the University of Miami, he served as the director of the developmental therapeutics program for the Siteman Cancer Center at Washington University from 2008 to 2017. Um, so without any further ado, I will hand the floor over to our first speaker, Dr. Lockhart. Unmute yourself, Craig, please. There you go. Sorry about that. The, uh, the, the person in control did not give me the control to unmute myself. So anyway, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so this, uh, this presentation is, um, is normally the, onco is the oncology annual update. Um, last year and the year before, uh, I did discuss two or three trials that I thought were um, practice changing where um, that I thought would change the way that we practice oncology. Um, what I'm going to present today is one particular regimen that seems to be um, being applied across the board to a variety of different tumor types. And um, just as internists, the rest of you who are not in oncology, I think it's important that we recognize that these, that this combination is going to be used across the board. And I'll come, come back to that in a second but then some of the toxicities that can be seen with this and some of the management of those toxicities. Having been on service over at the tower, we are seeing, um, we are seeing this combination being used in outpatient and seeing the toxicities associated with that. And sometimes there is some um, concern about what the right way is to manage those toxicities. So I would like to talk a little bit about that as well. So um, our objectives today are, it's not 40, okay. Um, to understand the rationale for the combination um, checkpoint inhibitor treatments, um, to appreciate the increasing indications for treatments of these, of these type of these combination regimens, to identify some of the medical systems that can be impacted, essentially almost all of them, with, um, by immunotherapy. And then um, there are guidelines on how to evaluate patients and how to apply the, uh, the therapies for these particular combination strategies. Okay, we'll start with the case. So EM is a 63-year-old woman with metastatic colon cancer. Um, originally, she was found to have two tumors, um, one in the sigmoid colon, one in the splenic flexure, and this was back in 2018. She underwent a resection of both tumors simultaneously, and she was found to have a fairly locally advanced tumor at that time. Um, she did receive standard adjuvant chemotherapy. It did take a little bit of time to get the chemother adjuvant chemotherapy delivered for her, because she had some toxicities and then there were some treatment delays for a variety of reasons. Um, but later on, she did develop her current disease in the pelvic wall and um, some lung lymphadenopathy detected on a PET scan in April of last year. Um, biopsy one of these lymph nodes, one of the pelvic lymph nodes did confirm the metastatic disease. And she was treated with, again, a standard frontline, a standard frontline chemotherapy. Um, because she had received adjuvant complete adjuvant chemotherapy relatively recently, she was given this full theory regimen than, than full Fox, which a lot of us sometimes start with. Now, um, I'm hoping that these project the, um, the molecular, she, she had that chemotherapy. She did not necessarily have any tumor shrinkage. It was just stable. Um, but we did molecular profiling of her tumor, and it did show that the tumor was MSI high, which was microsatellite unstable. And um, so she was a potential candidate for dual immunotherapy. What I'm trying to show here on the CT scan is there's a, a lymph node in the chest. And then you can, I don't know if you'd be able to appreciate, but some of the pelvic sidewall disease here, that was biopsied. And again, that was where the biopsy took place and it confirmed metastatic disease. So again, she was started on this dual immunotherapy in September of last year. 
So when we think about colorectal cancer, it does fall into four molecular subtypes that um, I think most of us are recognizing. In CMS1, which is where our patients would, the category our patient would fall into, it represents about 14% of the patients that are diagnosed, but a relatively small percentage of the patients who have metastatic disease. These, these tumors tend to be uh, microsatellite unstable. They're hypermutated. Um, they're, they tend to have immune infiltration activation at the tumor site and overall worse survival after relapse, although their survival in earlier stages tends to be actually better. So while 14% of all the patients diagnosed fall into this subtype, only about 5% of the patients with metastatic disease fall into this subtype. So um, this, she would fall into this particular colorectal cancer subtype. That being said, um, if, they, if the tumor is microsatellite unstable, they tend to have 10 to 100 times the number of somatic mutations, as mutations in a tumor, leading to truncated proteins and neoantigens. So the idea here that the neoantigens would make these tumors more attractive to the immune system so that immunotherapy might work. You do see increased tumor lymphocyte infiltration um, at the tumor. So if we look at our um, immunohistochemistry um, sections below, if we have a microsatellite stable tumor versus one like our patient that's microsatellite unstable, you do see increased numbers of immune cells on immunohistochemistry. Um, this is both at the invasive front of the tumor and also within the, the tumor stroma itself. Also, these tumors tend to express checkpoint ligands, PD1, PDL1, CTLA4. If you look at PDL1, again at the invasive front in the unstable tumor versus a stable tumor, you see increased numbers and also in the tumor stroma. So again, there are reasons why these tumors might be more attractive to immune therapy. Um, again, I think I've shown this slide before. We have a mutation, you have a neoantigen, the antigen presenting cells presented to the T cells, and um, it leads to a T cell response, increased mutations, increased antigens, increased immune response. How the T cell, um, response is, is mediated, is mod modulated. We have activating receptors and inhibitor receptors, and the two I'm going to focus on today are CTLA-4 and PD-1. Both of these are involved with suppressing the immune system's recognition of tumor cells. So when these are, when these path, when these checkpoints are activated, you have the tumors not being recognized by the immune system, so the tumor is able to, to grow um, like, like it wants to, but one, if we can inhibit these pathways, we can then inhibit, um, we can then lead to anti-tumor effects. So looking at these two in particular, um, CTLA-4, as I mentioned, is a ne negative regulator of co-stimulation. Um, again, it can be blocked with, uh, with drugs that we have available now. If, the, uh, if there's activation of an um, anti-tumor T cell in the lymph node, it then recognizes antigen presented by the antigen presenting cell like we just talked about in the last slide. There's um, T cell receptor triggering, negative um, regulatory receptor PD-1 expressed, um, interferon gamma produced. And so then you have, so you basically have these activated, activated T cells once CTLA-4 can be blocked. Blocking CTLA-4 and PD-1 together simultaneously, we would expect that there would be synergy if we, if we um, block both of these checkpoints at the same time. That has been shown in the lab and it actually has translated into, into patient care. So this is a regimen that has now been commonly applied and I'll talk a little bit about the, the reasons, the talk a little bit about the history of that. So coming back to our patients, this combination inhibition um, was applied to patients with microsatellite unstable, like our patient MSI high, patients um, with colorectal cancer. And again, these patients have received prior chemotherapies that received, in most cases, two lines or higher of uh, chemotherapy. And in general, you don't see responses in those patients. You see a lot of stable disease. You might see a response rate in the 10 to 15% range. But here we saw objective response rates around greater than 50%. Um, you can see this on the waterfall plot where um, a huge number of these patients had responses that were greater than, than 30%. And also, if you look at um, overall survival, again, the, the curve is relatively, relatively flat. You'd expect the curve to go down quite significantly more if these therapies were not effective. So they saw high response rates with this combination. 
They were encouraging progression-free survival and overall survival at 12 months. The safety profile was manageable. There had been a lot of experience with this looking at patients with uh, melanomas, and there were meaningful improvements in quality of life and patient-reported outcomes. So our patient um, started ipilimumab plus nivolumab again back in September of last year. She's now on maintenance therapy with monthly nivolumab, um, and she's been on that since December. And again, I'm, the, this, these pictures might be a little bit small, but basically the lymph node that we were seeing there before has essentially, they're not calling it anymore. And then some of the pelvic sidewall disease, are not really calling that anymore either. So in general, this is somebody who has had a good response to therapy. She's having essentially no side effects. And the only thing we ever talk about is when she's going to stop wearing her wig because her hair has grown back, but she's not happy with the way it is because of COVID, she can't get a haircut. And so that's essentially what we talk about on our visits these days. Okay, Moves, but that with colorectal cancer, we did adopt that dual therapy, but before that, there was a story in melanoma. And this has been published a number of times in the New England Journal. This goes back to this, this study from 2017 when um, uh, nivolumab and um, ipilimumab were combined and given to patients with melanoma. You, you can see that the progression free survival is 11.5 months. Um, it was the odor all survival was not reached. If you look at nivolumab alone, it was 6.9, ipilimumab alone 2.9, nivolumab alone was 37.6, ipi alone 19.9. So again, this was a study that showed that the combination therapy was meaningful. This is, it is one of the combinations that, that's applied regularly to patients with um, advanced melanoma. Similarly, in renal cell cancers, um, again, the same dual immunotherapy was applied. Um, this was compared to sunitinib, which at the time was one of the standard therapies. And again, approximately equal numbers of patients. Median overall survival was not reached um, in the dual therapy. It was, re it was reached with the sunitinib. Progression-free survival, again, was appeared to be better with the combination regimen. Again, so this is another, another area where this regimen is being standardly applied. All right, so what's new? So more recently, and this was just, um, we, we just got notification about FDA approval about two weeks ago now, um, and this is now being applied in non-small cell lung cancer. So, non, so lung cancer is the most common cancer, period. Um, what, I think the next three cancers don't add up to the numbers of lung cancer patients that are diagnosed annually. So again, this is a large population of patients. In the Checkmate 227 study, it's a relatively, it's a study that has multiple arms, and I'll discuss that here in a second. Um, one of the, the data from one of these arms was presented late last year, but it did lead to FDA approval for this same combination, ipilimumab and nivolumab, to be applied to patients with pdl one expressing non-small cell lung cancers. So um, in this study, they enrolled about 12, they had about 1,200 patients who had pdl one expression. They were treated with the, with the combination regimen and um, it was, they also looked at patients that had not expressed PDL1. But what they did show was that the median overall, median overall survival was compared versus chemotherapy. This is a, was a standard um, platinum containing doublet. And while that's actually, that was pretty good for, for doublet chemotherapy, the combination of nivolumab and, and ipilimumab was better. Um, so this is now one of these, again, just received FDA approval. This is one of the standard first line treatments for metastatic non-small cell lung cancer and those that express PDL1 greater than 1%. The patients who receive this have to have no EGFR tumor aberrations because those patients do have targeted therapies that are, that are quite effective and no ALK tumor aberrations. Again, they have, um, they have targeted therapy that's also quite effective. If you look at the force plot, you can see that the, in the majority of the subgroups, um, except for those that had a lower expression of PDL1, patients seem to benefit from the dual immunotherapy regimen as, a, as compared to, to chemotherapy alone. So again, as I said, it's approved in, in melanoma, approved in renal cell, as we use it a lot in colorectal cancer. Now we have non-small cell lung cancer where we're also seeing this regimen being applied. We'll come back to the toxicities here. But you can see that there is, as far as grade three, four toxicities, those toxicities that are considered more serious, you do see some diarrhea, you see some skin rash, fatigue, we talked, fatigue is, well, you see that with everything. And then, um, but you also, treatment, some, you, 
there's a relatively high incidence of treatment related serious adverse events. One of the things that I want to highlight here for the non oncologist is that you don't really see neutropenia. And this is one of the toxicities that we're so used to seeing with chemotherapy. You didn't see you know, much in the way of neutropenia at all. That was high grade um, in this particular study where you saw that a lot with the patients receiving chemotherapy. So is this regimen useful in all cancers? As I said, we have, we have, we, it's already FDA approved in three, um, probably four if you consider colorectal cancer. Is it, is it useful in all cancers? And this is, uh, this is what I did over a few days ago, was trying to find out, is there any cancer where this is not being at least studied? And so in almost every cancer that I could think of, um, maybe anal cancer is not here, but in almost every, every cancer that I could think of, there is either a publication, there's either or an ongoing clinical trial that go through clinicaltrials.gov, or there's a publication through ASCO Abstracts that people are seeing responses with this particular kind of combination therapy. In some cancers where for a long time there hasn't really been a good standard, adenoid cystic, those were always the patients that were put onto clinical trials because there wasn't anything that necessarily works for them. For the anaplastic thyroid cancers that are very fast growing aggressive cancers, there are studies showing that there was some efficacy there. Adrenal cortical, another one, um, another cancer type where we don't see, where again, typical, uh, we don't have a lot of therapies for those patients. There are ongoing clinical trials with that, with this dual immunotherapy regimen. So it looks like it's going to be widely applied. Now we like to think of um, precision medicine saying that we want to, to um, really fashion therapy based on someone's molecular profiling, and that is still going on. But I'm just saying that this particular regimen seems to have broad-based applicability. That being said, it does in some in some tumors it works quite well, where you don't really have to uh, go into a lot of detail as far as figuring out um, molecular profiling. But there are some other cancers, and I'll give an example here in the, in, in pancreas cancer, where it seems to be helpful that if you can molecularly profile the tumor or molecularly profile the patient, that you can try to identify particular populations of patients that are more likely to be sensitive to this, to this particular dual regimen. Uh, what I'd like to see here, show here is that pdl one expression seems to be one of those um, factors that if you can figure out pdl one expression, sometimes that helps to, to predict which patients are going to respond. Um, tumor mutational burden and new antigen load. Um, again, th those make sense from an immunotherapy standpoint. DNA damage repair pathways. Um, again, if those are affected, tumors will ha are more likely to have more neoantigens, more higher tumor mutational burden. Um, here at University of Miami, there's a lot of work looking at the gut microbiome and can the does a patient's gut microbiome now predict for what they may respond to and how how does gut microbiome actually interact with the um, with a sort of the the immune milieu. And then there's also a lot of work going on with the JAK-STAT pathway and how that pathway interacts um, with interleukins and then also with, uh, with, with immune therapy. So with pancreatic cancer, this, this is a poster that was presented by uh, one of our fellows, um, Dr. Torero, and she, she's mentored by Dr. Hussein. It's a poster that was presented at ASCO just a week ago. And um, what they noted was that Patients with, again, these are germline mutations. Um, germline mutations, so we're looking at some of these repair, these um, genes that have to do with uh, DNA repair. And this is, my, this is one of my patients from Deerfield Beach. He's a gentleman who had pancreatic cancer. Well, he has, he's had a complete response, so you can't really, I guess he still has pancreas cancer, but he had a complete response. He is somebody who received, he had surgery first, then he had adjuvant chemotherapy that was then standard at the time. And he had a biopsy proven recurrent disease in the lung and retroperitoneum. He started ipilimumab and nivolumab um, as part of a clinical trial. He had received some other chemotherapies before that. And he has a complete response. This has been ongoing now for 20 months. He works at Miami International Airport and he comes in once a month for his, um, for his nivolumab infusion because now he's just on maintenance therapy with nivolumab. And again, this is somebody who's done well. What Dr. Hussein and his team have shown is that um, patients with, again, germline alterations, um, germline alterations may 
may predict for which patients could, re could respond to some of these immunotherapies. The response rate that they're seeing with this was somewhere in the order of 40%. But again, almost unheard of, number one, immunotherapy working in pancreas cancers in general, when that has been looked at in pancreas cancer, didn't really show anything. And then also um, finding the right patients to target with this particular doublet regimen. Now, as, since this is Medicine Grand Rounds, um, we're going to talk about some of the toxicities associated with that. Now, again, I want to highlight again that this is not, these are not chemotherapy toxicities. These are, these are toxicities associated with immune therapies. So if we look at, if we look at for ipilimumab alone, it can have some GI toxicities. Um, nivolumab, the GI toxicities are a lot less, but they're additive when you put the, when you, oops, when you put the two together, the toxicities tend to be additive. Um, so we do see patients getting admitted with colitis and diarrhea. We do see more of the endocrinopathies with this particular, with this particular combination. Um, and again, but there are guidelines on how do, we, how do we manage these things. And then the other one I want to highlight, because it was relatively high, was pancreatitis. I mean, we do see that a fair amount. But I have had patients on the oncology service who admitted with nephritis, with hepatitis, and who have been receiving this combination regimen. This is a patient that, that we took care of um, in the clinic. Um, second case, 76-year-old woman with metastatic pancreatic cancer. Her prior therapies were standard and cytobine and apaclitaxel, and then before that, 5-FU and, and um, Naliri. And then her mo molecular profiling of her tumor. Now, I'll remind you that what Dr. Hossein had in his abstract was the, um, those were germline um, alterations. This person had a tumor alteration in the ataxia telangiectasia um, gene, and it was gene altered there. We thought that she, this is somebody on a clinical trial who might be, who might respond to ipilimumab plus nivolumab. This was started um, in August of last year on protocol. She did complain of worsening fatigue. So this was her, these were her baseline labs, although she started treatment on the 5th. A week later, her labs were somewhat changed, but not, did not reach the point of where, um, you know, an intervention was necessarily needed. However, a week later, her labs were off the wall, where she was complaining of dark urine, fatigue, her, her labs had really gone out of whack. So this is somebody that we at least need to consider um, immune-related hepatitis or treatment-related hepatitis um, related to her immunotherapy. Obviously, for somebody with um, pancreas cancer, you have to think about, think about something like rapid disease progression. If somebody has, or there are other liver, tox liver toxic agents that somebody's taking that could be accounting for what we're seeing here. No, I don't, I don't believe you can, you may not be able to read this. I'm having a hard time reading it myself. But um, patients with, again, relatively asymptomatic alterations in the ALT and AST, um, those patients you don't, you could consider, consi could consider continuing the immune therapy and just monitoring their labs um, and management supportive care. Once you get to grade two, where you started seeing the AST and ALT, like we saw in our patients, where they were greater than three, that's when you need to hold the immunotherapy. This person was only getting, was, did not even receive a second dose of immunotherapy. This was just based on their first dose. And then after that, we need to consider uh, corticosteroids. The majority of patients that we tend, that I've been seeing on, at least on service, tend to be the ones that are, again, admitted to the hospital. And that's where we need to, to jump in with the, the steroids. I would say that in general, we've had more success with the IV solumedrol versus doing the oral prednisone. There are guidelines that have been put out by ASCO to help us manage these patients. Um, in general, the guidelines start out that a, the clinicians need to discuss with the patient and family that this is not chemotherapy, this is something different, and that um, we need to provide them educational materials about the mechanism of action of how these drugs work, and that we need, need to look out for different potential side effects than we're used to seeing with the chemotherapy there should be a high level of suspicion that new symptoms associated um, since starting therapy are potentially treatment related. So in general, when the, uh, the checkpoint inhibitor therapy could be continued with close monitoring for again, relatively mild toxicities. However, once the toxicities get to grade two or higher, you need to, cons you need to consider starting corticosteroids. Um, when it gets to grade three, as I said, my, I've seen more success with using the, um, the IV steroids at more towards the two milligram per kilogram dose level rather than the one milligrams. 
And if that's not effective, infliximab has been used. I have personally not given infliximab to a patient, but um, it does happen sometimes when patients have severe colitis um, to, to administer that to help to, to reverse that. In general, if, um, if some, once somebody has resolution of their immune toxicities, you then can consider re rechallenging, restarting therapy. If they've had grade four, the recommendation is not to restart therapy, but if they have grade three and they've now, their toxicity have now dropped down to grade one, you could reconsider rechallenging re them. I wouldn't necessarily rechallenge them with a dual immunotherapy, you might consider one or the other. There is a time course associated with some of these. In our case here, our patient um, was two weeks in, and so she would, she would have fallen on the bell-shaped curve, a little bit early on the bell-shaped curve for her, where we did see the, uh, the immune-related toxicities. And so sometimes, based on some of this information, you can start to try to predict uh, what the toxicity might be related to immune therapy. So to conclude, checkpoint inhibitor combination are being applied to an increasing number of cancers, and not just this combination, other combinations are being considered. Um, investigation predicting efficacy are ongoing. As I said, this is being generally applied. The immune-related adverse events are unique. Mechanism-based toxicities that are distinct from chemotherapy, so we can't just go in there thinking about um, neutropenia with fever. We have to think, consider other things. Um, you do see increased rates of immune-related adverse events with the dual immunotherapies compared to single agents. And again, the quite often with appropriate interventions, usually you, you, through the use of corticosteroids or other immune suppressants, we can reverse these things and in some cases have the patients um, reconsidered for immune therapy at a later date. Thank you for your attention. Great, thank you very much. That was really exciting and promising to hear that these um, two drugs or combination of these immunotherapies can somehow um, treat cancers that we haven't been able to treat before. Is there any um, movement towards uh, having this as first line therapy uh, as opposed to doing it after the traditional chemotherapy fails? Yes, for, for several cancers, it's first line. For, um, as I said, for melanoma, for renal cell, for lung cancers, again, um, and then for colorectal cancers, data just came out from ASCO last week that um, now immunotherapy can be considered frontline therapy for patients with um, MSI high colorectal cancer. So definitely shifting away from, in certain cancers, um, shifting away from chemotherapy. As I mentioned, there's some of these rare cancers in there that um, I haven't seen in a long time, the adrenal corticoid and yeah. adrenal cortical and so, you know, these anaplastic thyroids, which, you know, again, to have something for those types of patients would be really, really exciting. And I hope that it's hard to do a large, as you know, those patients are relatively rare. It's hard to do a large enough study to um, have, you know, real, a real error bars on what efficacy would be like. But I anticipate that if they do see something, those would fall into the orphan disease categories where immunotherapy may become, or dual immunotherapy may become the frontline therapy. Thank you, Craig. Dr. Krill, uh, D Jackson, do you want to ask a question? Unmute yourself. Sure, Craig. So in this, thank you for this talk. Uh, Craig, in this um, day and age with COVID, um, I've been warning my patients on immune therapy about if they end up in the hospital with, with pneumonitis symptoms to make sure we're involved. Um, but how can we um, differentiate for our patients, you know, COVID, pulmonary symptoms versus pneumonitis symptoms, because um, the treatments are very different. Uh, agreed. Um, so I have, a, I have a question for you. I'll throw the, the, the Socratic method, I'll throw it back at you. What do you tell your patients as far as immunosuppression goes with the, when you're doing immunotherapy? What do you tell them as far as immunosuppression is concerned? You mean in their risk for severe COVID? In their risk for, you know, quite often a lot of the patients are concerned to come to the medical center because, you know, the ones on chemotherapy because they're afraid their immune systems are suppressed. What, you, what are you telling your patients as far as their immune systems are concerned when they're on immunotherapy? Well, unfortunately, in the breast realm, that's very few of our patients yes, because yes, we haven't true. joined your immune therapy party yet uh, in a major way. But um, I, I do tell them that, you know, that we don't know at this point whether immune therapies might um, increase your risk for uh, other infectious diseases, 
um, clearly in inflammatory diseases, they can be increased. And we don't know in, in a case like COVID where you can see cytokine storm, whether a patient on immune therapy might be worse off or better off. We don't know. Um, I, I tell them that they have to be checked out if they have significant symptoms, they can call us, but they shouldn't be afraid to go into the emergency room and, you know, just to be very careful for exposures. What do you think? No, I, I consider that these therapies are less immunosuppressive than chemotherapy, obviously. I, you know, in breast cancer, they said, you're right, that, you know, outside of triple negative, there hasn't been a lot of, uh, there are studies there, but there haven't been a lot of success with immunotherapy at this point. Um, I think we have to rely on the testing. You know, we have to rely on if somebody comes in, um, I don't think that they're quite as immune suppressed as chemotherapy patients. So I do think that their risk is somewhat lower as far as, um, you know, infectious complications are concerned. Um, I can't necessarily prove that, but, um, but I, I think we have, we're rely, reliant on the COVID testing. If, they're, if they test negative, I think we need to, to have a high index of suspicion about pneumonitis and, and try to treat them that way. I agree. Thank I you think very much. I think we're going to have to go get on. testing quickly now. Thank you. Okay. Um, there, there are other, there's another question on the chat, Craig, if you could look at it, that'd be great and, and answer. Um, I think we'll move on to our next speaker now. Thank you very much. Dr. Like Pitt, no. we're going to transplant. Uh, um, quick question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. but you can answer that on the chat. On the chat. Okay, we'll do it. Thanks. Dr. Patel, unmute yourself. All right, so our second presentation today will be done by Dr. Rafael Calderon Candelario, who is an assistant professor of clinical medicine at the University of Miami and the associate program director for the Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine Fellowship at the University of Miami. Dr. Calderon earned his medical degree and completed his residency in internal medicine at the University of Puerto Rico. He subsequently obtained his master's in science at the Ohio State University which is also where he completed his fellowship training in pulmonary and critical care medicine. Some highlights of his research include publications about COPD, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and mycobacterial infection. He has a recent book chapter published in Neurocritical Care about severe hypoxia in the Neurocritical Care Unit. With that being said, I will hand the floor over to Dr. Calderon. Good afternoon. Can you see my screen well? Yes. Okay. Um, so my clinical focus in, um, in my clinics is usually in asthma and COPD, obstructive lung disease. So I'm going to try to provide an update in, in what's happened in asthma in, within the, the last year. Um, it is not the purpose of this talk to be, you know, all encompassing with regards to asthma, just to provide a, a couple of key points um, from the last years. I do not have any uh, disclosures. Um, our objectives will be to um, examine important changes in asthma treatment from the last year, evaluate an approach to treatment of severe and difficult to treat asthma, and a brief comment on, on COVID and, and, and asthma. We're gonna start off with a case of a 42-year-old Puerto Rican woman who presents to your clinic for evaluation of asthma. She had asthma as a child and had been using inhalers intermittently. She recently moved to Miami and wants to establish care. She has symptoms of non-productive cough and chest tightness once or twice a month. You order a spirometry and it is within normal limits. Based on this information, we're going to do a quick poll here of which inhaler would you prescribe. This vignette was intentionally vague. And so was the question to be able to think about um, what we're going to discuss. So we're going to leave it for a couple more seconds more. And go from there. So if you can see, this was your selection. And this will be a basis for our discussion. There's not one particular answer um, that is appropriate here, but we'll discuss why. Okay, so the, the framework for this talk will be the Global Initiative for Asthma um, guidelines, particularly, um, not guidelines, treatment strategies, I should say, 
um, particularly what's been new in the last year. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with GINA, although I think um, um, most of you are, this was established by the WHO and the National Heart and Lung Blood Institute in 1993 to increase awareness about asthma, improve asthma prevention and management, and, and do a coordinated worldwide effort. This is similar to the gold initiative for COPD, but applicable to asthma. Their guidelines are updated on a yearly basis um, um, based on um, literature review for that year. Um, their, their treatment strategies, I, I should say. Um, which is different from the national education and prevention treatment that we have nationally that hasn't gone and undergone a, a significant update since 2007. It is supposed to, to have published some updates now, but GINA uh, keeps itself updated. Uh, brief definition of asthma. So it's a heterogeneous disease usually characterized by chronic airway inflammation defined by the history of respiratory symptoms such as wheeze, shortness of breath, chest tightness, and cough that vary over time and intensity together with variable airflow limitation. It's a disease that has a significant burden. More than 25 million Americans have asthma, um, which accounts for around 8% uh, of adults and, and children. It's been increasing since the early 80s in all age and race groups, and it has a significant uh, economic cost uh, up to, or worth to uh, 81 billion in the last, um, from 2008 to 2013, and associated to a loss of uh, work and school days. There are significant differences and disparities in asthma. It's more common in adult women. Um, racial and ethnic differences in asthma frequency, illness and death are highly connected to poverty, city air quality, um, changes in uh, lack of patient education and poor access to healthcare. Um, the rate of asthma and prevalence of it is the highest amongst Puerto Ricans compared to all ethnic groups. However, African Americans are three um, times more likely to die from asthma, especially African American women. So. Um, these treatment strategies hope to um, you know, provide um, knowledge of appropriate asthma care so that we can try to, um, as much as we can, reduce some of these um, differences and disparities. The goals of asthma treatment are basically symptom control. We want less asthma symptoms. We want less um, nighttime symptoms that may disrupt sleep and that people are able to tolerate their activities. Reduce the risk by trying to maintain the lung function on a normal uh, uh, levels, prevent exacerbations, <clears throat> uh, prevent death, and whenever we can, minimize um, medication side effects. Um, patients' goals are important to take in mind with regards to what they want to get out of their treatment, and this uh, has a significant impact on selection of treatment for them. <clears throat> so from 2014 um, till um, last year, um, Gina has proposed this stepwise um, approach to asthma treatment with a, with a, you know, a continuous cycle of assessing um, the patient's uh, symptoms, um, adjusting treatment as necessary, and then reviewing the response to the treatment and stepping up and stepping down. Important to highlight here that uh, what's been, um, sorry, what's been um, key for um, Gina um, and treatment strategy in the past is that for people that have intermittent symptoms, there was really no uh, preferred controller um, recommended. And um, what had been recommended was um, reliever medication as, as needed short acting beta agonist. Um, as you stepped up in therapy, inhaled corticosteroids became the mainstay of, um, of treatment, either uh, alone or in combination with long acting bronchodilators, but continued having short acting beta agonist as a reliever. And this has been the paradigm for many, many years. Last year, there was a fundamental change in this paradigm where um, basically the treatment of asthma with short-acting bronchodilators alone is no longer recommended for adults and adult adolescents. Um, they should receive symptom-driven um, or daily corticosteroid inhaler to reduce the risk of severe exacerbations. <clears throat> the reason for this is that in patients um, that have what typically is considered as mild asthma, they have, they're at risk of having very serious uh, adverse events. So um, 30 to 37% of adults with acute asthma, 16% of near fatal asthma, and around 20% of people that died of asthma had symptoms that might have been considered in that intermittent category. So um, based on that, the strategy so far, they would only have been treating with short acting bronchodilators such as albuterol or salbutamol. Exacerbation, exacerbation triggers can be very variable. <clears throat> um, 
inhaled Saba has been the mainline treatment for um, these intermittent symptoms for more than 50 years. Um, and one of the problems with this is that because of the effect of having that immediate relief from the from the Saba, some people um, feel like that is what works for them the best. And it led to um, people not using their controller medications when they were in steps of therapy uh, upwards of one. So people only use the albuterol, relied only on the, the albuterol, um, not using the inhaled corticosteroid, which is what actually is controlling the inflammation underlying asthma. <clears throat> this frequent use of, of only short-acting um, bronchodilators without an addition of a uh, inhaled corticosteroids to control the inflammation has been associated with beta receptor downregulation, decreased bronchoprotection, rebound hyperresponsiveness, and decreased bronchodilator response, as well as increased inflammation, which creates a, a vicious cycle of, of need for more um, inhalers. <clears throat> and higher use of these inhalers has been associated with um, increased risk of um, emergency department presentations um, and increased risk of death. Here we see a graphical representation of this risk. On the first graph on the left, we see um, as the number of canisters go up, the risk of death increases. And particularly the threshold at more than 12 canisters a year. Um, so around one, um, if the patients go through a one uh, inhaler a month of the rescue medication, um, it's associated with increased risk of death. This uh, the panel in the middle, when we look at it, um, people that died from asthma versus controls, we see that people that had died had higher levels of sal or salbutamol, which is a SABA um, in, in, um, associated. And people that had, in the last panel on the right, people that had used more than three canisters had an increased risk of having um, um, visits to the ED by only having more than three canisters per year. So, for safety and to try to uh, prevent this, this risk associated to SABA alone, GINA no longer recommends SABA only treatment for step one. And this is based on this information that we've just presented. Um, so now the recommendation is that all adults and adolescents with asthma should receive some ICS containing controller treatment to reduce the risk of serious exacerbations. This can be delivered uh, on a daily treatment or intermittent um, as needed based on symptom triggering um, on people that have milder disease. This strategy is intended to reduce you know, complications at the population level. Um, there might be um, different strategies that you may need to um, focus on the individual. Um, <clears throat> what you can see from this graph and why the emphasis on the formoterol is that for motoral ICS containing regimens um, have a quick onset of action similar to that of salbutamol or the equivalent albuterol. So for this strategy to work, the reliever medication that contains ICS needs to be for motoral containing um, because the, the onset of action is, is similar to albuterol as you can see in this curve here with the um, change in FEV1 <clears throat> from baseline and the time after drug administration. So they get quick relief similar to albuterol with a decrease in the um, side effects commonly seen with uh, albuterol or salbutamol, such as the heart rate. And when this strategy is used um, as a maintenance and um, reliever therapy, <clears throat> we see that um, we have a reduced number of exacerbations um, with the same or uh, equivalent dose of, of higher of our inter um, as compared to the same dosing of the inhaled corticosteroids or higher and using short-acting bronchodilators. <clears throat> so that um, timely extra inhalations of the steroid seems to be the key for controlling um, the asthma and reducing the risk. And based on, uh, on this, Gina has proposed this new um, step paradigm then in step one, um, we see that albuterol as needed is no longer there. And the recommendation is to use IC or SABA, I should say, ICS for motoral containing medications as the primary treatment for this. Um, another thing that you will notice is that as you move from step one to step three, 
um, you could continue with the same ICS for model um, as needed in step one and step three, and then um, schedule um, step step one and step two, and then schedule in step three. So this um, in uh, in the U.S. we have two main for model containing um, inhalers. One is um, budesonide for model um, commercial name Symbicort. The other was Mometasone for model commercial name Dulera. Um, um, so those are the ones that are applicable for for the reliever um, part or the as needed part. Um, when you have a patient that has been on on a on a long term inhaler and they're well controlled, like fluticasone and salmeterol, for an example, they may be very hesitant to change. Um, so what um, as an alternative, you could um, as long as they're receiving consistently and compliant with the ICS, if they're already established on a lava ICS medication that is not from moral containing, you could keep the SAVA with appropriate um, with appropriate education about the importance of, of the of the steroid. Um, the other reason for that, and and one of the things that we've encountered from a practical perspective in the clinic, is that when you try to um, prescribe. Um, a lava ICS um, for motor containing medication and use that as, as, a, as a reliever as well. Insurances and pharmacies are, are not quite um, there yet with the guidelines. So you may get notifications that the patient is refilling their medication too soon, or they, they may not cover two different kinds of, uh, of lava ICS. <clears throat> Since um, they proposed this, the, they changed the treatment strategy uh, last year, there's been additional studies that support the use of, of LABA ICS um, uh, for motoral ICS combinations in mild asthma. One is the novel START study, and the other is the practical, where they showed significant reduction in severe exacerbations compared to SABA and um, no difference in symptom control. <clears throat> Both of these studies showed a decrease in the inflammatory markers, which we would expect, pheno being one of them um, um, that we follow. Um, based on the in, uh, increased use of the ICS and a reduction on, in severe exacerbations. Um, an additional randomized trial um, of um, ICS whenever SABA is taken um, was done in children with asthma and we just finished enrolling here like a month and a ago, ago, ago a trial that studied the use of beclomethasone on top of the SABA. So the role of having a SABA ICS combination in the future and where would it fit, um, we still don't know, but we have we hope to have some information on that soon. <clears throat> this is the data that uh, that I mentioned from the novel start and the practical. When you look at this first panel here, uh, label B, um, time to save the first severe exacerbation, and the probability of no severe exacerbation is lower on the blue line, which is the budesonide for motor, when you compare to the um, budesonide maintenance alone um, with albuterol. You see in the bottom panel here, a reduction of the um, inflammatory markers that we can follow in clinic um, uh, with the pheno associated with the steroid use. And in the practical study, kind of the same concept. Note the probability of no severe exacerbations is higher on the budesonide for motor group compared to um, traditional uh, treatment with um, ICS maintenance and SAVA um, um, reliever. <clears throat> so they have proposed this um, this um, suggested initial control of treatment based on on what symptoms they have and um, presented in, in, in pictorial form. With asthma in general, it's important to confirm the diagnosis. Make sure that you control any other modifiable, modifiable risk factors if patients are smoking. Um, as an example, comorbidities, people, um, the symptoms of asthma are, you know, cough, shortness of breath that are, uh, may be very nonspecific and could be uh, influenced by many other things. Uh, we see a lot of comorbidities with GERD, a lot of comorbidities with sleep apnea, daytime fatigue and, and, and shortness of breath is very difficult to differentiate. So assessing comorbidities is very important. 
inhaler technique and adherence, particularly when we're um, moving um, to this new strategy of using low dose ICS and formoro containing regimens. Um, so, uh, a comment on maximum dose. So, uh, 12 inhalations a day is um, is what's recommended by the manufacturer. So, if they're using their inhaler uh, more than uh, every four hours um, or six times a day, two puffs, um, they should probably be seeking help from you uh, uh, or or um, because their symptoms are not well controlled. Some other update from the last year, um, Montelucast, which is a drug that we commonly use as, as an adjuvant, particularly in patients that have rhinitis, has a new black box warning um, with, due to um, serious neuropsychiatric events associated, including suicidality. So this, um, Montelucast now joins the list of other medications that we use as a Chantix or, or Roflumilas that we need to warn the patients if, the, if they're going to con either continue on the medication or start on the medication um, to, to be mindful of the symptoms. Now we're going to do um, focus a little bit of, of, of on some updates. They updated them in the um, treatment of severe asthma. Um, they, uh, Gina also has a strategy that focuses only on on the treatment of severe asthma, and, and they just updated that on, on last year. <clears throat> Some terminology that it's important to discuss, um, uncontrolled asthma is people that are having frequent symptoms. Many of these patients have um, mild asthma, and they could be controlled if they're um, taking ICS um, low dose regularly. Difficult to treat asthma means that you have asthma that is uncontrolled despite high dose preventer treatment. Some of the factors that could lead to difficult to treat asthma could be an incorrect diagnosis, incorrect inhaler technique, poor adherence, or other comorbidities that they need to be addressed. <clears throat> and severe asthma has had many different meanings, but what we come to understand by it now is that asthma that is uncontrolled despite maximal um, optimized therapy, and you have tr identified and treated the, the, the contributory factors or that you're in, in a step of therapy and you try to de-escalate that therapy and, 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 and the asthma flares up. <clears throat> so how common is this severe asthma? So around 24% of people are in step four or five of GINA treatment. From these, around 17% um, uh, fall under the difficult to treat asthma because they're in step four and step five and have significant symptoms. And around 4% of this have poor symptom control despite good adherence and inhaler technique, um, thus labeled severe asthma. So severe asthma can present um, differently. This is a, a slide that is very commonly used in many asthma presentations where you have the differences of how asthma presents as a type two or, or more allergic type versus non-allergic type. Another, um, um, the non-allergic type is associated with more with obesity, smoking, neutrophilic um, versus the allergic one, which is the more classic uh, presentation of asthma, more uh, eosinophilic type. Um, another way of looking at this based on, 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 on tools that we have and things that we follow in clinic is with this diagram. So on the top, you see on the purple squares, some of the factors that we can modify, exposure to allergens, um, um, cigarette smoke, et cetera. On blue, we have some of the biomarkers that we follow in clinics. So the fraction of excretion of nitric oxide and the eosinophils. And on the red and orange, we have some of the pathways that we have uh, treatments for in severe asthma. So on the left, we have IgE, which we've had the drug omalizumab um, for a while. That's a reminder for me for time, sorry. Um, um, in here, we have an interleukin-4, which we have a, a recent drug called dupilumab that we can use as a treatment for this pathway. And in the middle, we have IL-5 that we have three drugs, um, mepolizumab, um, benralizumab, and reslizumab um, as possible um, approaches for, for this disease. So. Recommendations that, that they make um, for as a general um, strategy for, for primary care is, you know, once you make a diagnosis of difficult to treat asthma, you need to confirm the, the diagnosis, consider a differential um, diagnosis, look for contributing factors, 
um, optimize the management, and this includes, you know, um, treating comorbidities, um, <clears throat> non-pharmacologic interventions like most smoking cessation and things like that, then reviewing your response. If you did all these things, you put them on appropriate inhaler therapy based on, on the steps, you control their comorbidities and they're still not control. In here is where, where a referral to a clinic such as mine or, or one of my colleagues could be appropriate, um, where we would do an assessment of the severe asthma phenotype. We would look at these um, biomarkers and then consider, um, consider non-biologic treatment as if they're not responding to that, we would start biologic treatments. The purpose of the slide is just to illustrate, you know, what are the main categories of, of the biologics treatments that we use? So anti-IgE, you need to have um, sensitization to allergy on, on specific IgE testing or skin prick um, and history of exacerbations. The anti-IL-5s, anti-IL-5 receptors we use based on eosinophil blood counts, the same for anti-IL-4. The strategy with this is evaluate these biomarkers see um, if they're elevated or not, and which they are elevated, discuss with the patients the different um, um, options that they have, and based on patient preference and, and, and what you think would be best, start a treatment and assess if they respond or not. If they respond, they maintain a good response, you continue. If they don't respond, you try another class of medications. <clears throat> um, and then you continue our communication between the specialist and primary care to continue either continue the current treatment or, or, or change plan. Um, that is basically a summary for um, severe asthma, a quick note on, COVID, note on COVID. So because it's an underlying lung condition, you might expect that uh, asthma patients would be at an increased risk of having you know, more se severity of COVID or increased complications of COVID. However, based on the information that we have right now, we haven't particularly seen that. So what we're recommending to patients and what Gina is recommending is just to continue the medications as usual, um, because if stopping um, the inhaled steroids out of concern that they might be you know, relatively immunosuppressing um, um, their system and their lungs, et cetera, could be potentially dangerous and could exacerbate their asthma. For patients that are on biologic therapy, the recommendation is to continue the biologic therapy. This might be um, problematic because this, some of them require for patients to come um, to the clinic and have their injections. So um, changes, um, so it, it might be a practical issue, but we're, we've been trying to continue with that um, and make sure they have a written action plan and. Um, we usually provide them with um, like a course of a, a possible exacerbation so they have that available in case they need. Some of the other general recommendations that we're also following in the hospital is avoid nebulizers because of risk of aerosolization. Spirometry needs to be done in caution. I'm sorry? We need to finish up in the next minute. Yeah, this is the last slide. Um, and then following strict infection control precaution. So, Basic points is that albuterol, which was the most common answer for the for the vignette, is no longer the preferred reliever medication for mild asthma or intermittent. We are now using low dose inhaled uh, corticosteroid for motoral. Montelukas, which is a very co commonly used drug, now has a black box warning due to neuropsychiatric effects, and um, we use eosinophil counts and pheno to be able to guide our use of of uh, the biologics that we have available to treat severe asthma. That is, and we should continue treatment during the COVID pandemic. Sorry, that might have been a little bit too ambitious to cover all those slides, but hope you got at least the main gist out of it. Thank you very much. That was great, Raphael, and thank you, Craig, as well. Those were two great talks. I think we both got, a, we all got a lot out of it. There'll be um, some questions on the chat and we'll get them to you, Raphael, as well. Everyone have a great, safe day, and thanks for participating in Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Be well.